it's used now as a way of saying that all of the forms of appreciation of art that were in place for centuries or millennia uh, in the 20th century were discarded. That beauty and pleasure in art, probably a human universal, were, began to be considered saccharine or kitsch or commercial. Uh, Barnett Newman had a famous quote that the impulse of modern art is the desire to destroy beauty, which was considered bourgeois or tacky. Uh, here's just uh, one example. I mean, this is a uh, perhaps a representative example of uh, visual depiction of the female form in the 15th century. Here is a uh, representative example of the depiction of the female form in the uh, 20th century. Uh, and as you can see, there, something has changed in the way the elite arts uh, appeal to the senses. Indeed, in, in uh, movements of modernism and postmodernism, uh, there was visual art without beauty, literature without narrative and plot, poetry without meter and rhyme, architecture and planning without ornament, human scale, green space, natural light, music without melody and rhythm, and criticism without clarity, attention to aesthetics, and insight into the human condition. Um, let me just give you an example to back up that last statement. But here, they're one of the most famous literary uh, English scholars of our time is the uh, Berkeley professor Judith Butler. Uh, and uh, here is a, an example of uh, one of her uh, analyses. The move from a structuralist account in which capital is understood to structure social relations in relatively homologous ways to a view of hegemony in which power relations are subject to repetition, convergence, and rearticulation brought the question of temporality into the thinking of structure and marked a shift from a form of Althusserian theory that takes structural totalities as theoretical objects. Well, you get the idea. Uh, by the way, this is one sentence. Uh, you, can actually, you can actually parse it. Well, uh, the argument in the blank slate was that um, elite art and criticism in the 20th century, although not the arts in general, uh, have disdained beauty, pleasure, clarity, insight, and style. People are staying away from elite art and criticism. What a puzzle. I wonder why. Uh, but um, it certainly uh, uh, inspired a, uh, uh, an energetic reaction from many uh, university professors. I would say the, the, the meaning of three key terms has changed in our time. Need now means wanting someone else's money. <laughs> Greed means wanting to keep your own. <laughs> and compassion is when the politician wants to arrange the transfer. <laughs> The book is called The Blank Slate, uh, based on the popular idea that the human mind is a blank slate and that all of its structure comes from socialization, culture, parenting, experience. The blank slate was an influential idea in the 20th century. Well, there are a number of political reasons why people have found it congenial. The foremost is that uh, if we're blank slates, then by definition, we are equal, because zero equals zero equals zero. But if something is written on the slate, then some people could have more of it than others, and according to this line of thinking, that would justify discrimination and inequality. Another political fear of uh, human nature is that uh, if we were blank slates, we can perfect mankind, the age-old dream of the perfectibility of our species, through social engineering, whereas if we're born with certain instincts, then perhaps some of them might condemn us to selfishness, prejudice, and violence. And needless to say, uh, there were certain risks in taking on uh, these subjects. There were moments in which I did feel nervous, knowing the history of uh, what has happened to people who've taken controversial uh, stands or uh, discovered disquieting findings in the uh, behavioral sciences. There are many cases, some of which I talk about in the book, of people who've been uh, slandered, uh, called Nazis, physically assaulted, threatened with criminal prosecution for uh, stumbling across or arguing uh, about controversial findings. Uh, and you never know when you're going to come across one of these booby traps. What Evola is proposing is a type of Platonism, 
and yeah, I use that term. And let me kind of explain that. Let me just go from revolt against the modern world, uh, the first paragraph of the first chapter, the world of tradition. Here it is, chapter one, the beginning. In order to understand both the spirit of tradition and its antithesis, modern civilization is necessary to begin with the fundamental doctrine of two natures. According to this doctrine, there is a physical order of things and a metaphysical one. There is a mortal nature and an immortal one. There is a superior realm of being and the inferior realm of becoming. Generally speaking, there is a visible and tangible dimension and prior to and beyond it an invisible and intangible dimension that is the support, the source, and true life of the former. I mean, from this we can see that he is proposing a metaphysics by which there are this different aspect of reality or this aspect of reality that exists in a realm of being which houses these traditional principles and if this world or becoming sort of partakes in them then we're living i.e. a traditional lifestyle. So here we have this kind of I'm going to say it a two world theory I mean y y we could I'd well, I'll just use that term because it's easy to understand and tends to be a standard interpretation of Plato, whereas I would go more for the participation metaphysics. And you could even view it in that way that this world, if it participates in these traditional forms, then you're living a traditional lifestyle. But here we have a metaphysics that many will disagree with. M many people who are white nationalists, Arianists, etc., don't like this metaphysics they want to use a scientific approach. They are positivist. They will state, no, only things that we can test, we can observe, we can verify. This is what we'll deal with. Anything else just believed to be existing in pure fantasy. They'll see the differences between the races due to the evolution that they had, to the, the different uh, environmental stresses, the different selection pressures that they had. And this is why they would explain the black-white uh, gap in intelligence and other things as well. It, here's sections from an article in the Occidental Observer written by Kevin MacDonald. What does an evolutionary psychologist say about all this? Parenthetically, I realize that the great majority of Americans do not believe in evolution. Nevertheless, evolutionary theory is a very powerful and scientifically credible way of looking at human behavior. It is no accident that one of the main strands of Jewish intellectual activism over the last century has been to oppose evolutionary theory as an explanatory tool in the social sciences. Darwin did indeed have a dangerous idea, dangerous to Jews because it provides a rational grounding for the ethnic identity and interest of the European-derived peoples. And many will argue that this is what's needed to attack cultural Marxism or neo-Marxism, a very scientific approach to things. They would look at kind of idealism as, you know, really something which is kind of as airy as sort of like a Marxist position. So they might appreciate Evola when it comes to his kind of from a poetic standpoint, but they might not want to appropriate his ideas as far as him explaining reality. Now, uh, the outlook of this or my outlook on this would be to really grasp Evola seriously. You're going to have to understand the tradition he comes from. And, and this is where I'm not going to be as upset or critiquing people who are or want to adopt this scientific position because I, I think they're being honest with themselves and I think that a lot of them don't have the philosophical background to go to Evola, which basically would be all of modern philosophy leading up to, to and from German idealism. And I remember I was in a discussion with somebody who newly found Evola and quote-unquote appreciates him, likes him, but made a comment to me and called me the last German romantic when I really wasn't into German romanticism, but mainly only in the sense that it does help to understand some aspects of German idealism. I mean, kind of shelling. I mean, he was engaging in a dialogue with a lot of German romantics as well, and he was part of that idealist tradition. But the thing is, is that the, stupid, the comment was stupid in the sense that you're not going to understand Evola if you don't understand that tradition. He is part of that tradition. He considered himself to be the logical fulfillment of transcendental idealism. And, and, and for that, let me kind of just read to you two paragraphs from the Gunahor website, which you know, talks about that. Evola was heir to this tradition, and his intellectual development took place in the milieu of 
Italian idealism in the 1920s. In order to study idealism thoroughly, Evola learned German so he could read the philosophical sources in their original language. Out of his studies, he created his own system which he named Absolute Idealism, or Magical Idealism. In the individual and becoming of the world, Evola ties together the main elements of his system. One can perhaps recognize Schopenhauer when Evola speaks of the world as will and as representation, or Stirner in the idea of the absolute ego, and Plotinus in the idea of probation and the evil of matter. And here's the last paragraph, which kind of hits my point perfectly. In our day, when tough-minded thinkers are drawn to science and materialism, the neo-Darwinist Richard Dawkins was recently voted the most intelligent man in Britain, the claims of idealism can seem incredible. Since Evola simply assumes a basic familiarity with this tradition, it may be difficult sometimes to see what he is getting at. For those new to idealism, I would recommend the philosophy of Schopenhauer by Brian McGee for a clear overview of the presuppositions and methods of idealism. Whether or not Evola adds to this tradition in a coherent and constructive way is for each man who has made the requisite effort to decide. Yeah, so there you go, it's a question of metaphysics. Uh, do you want to have uh, Evola's type of idealism? Or do you want to be a positivist or materialist? That'll be the question. And if you want to adopt a position of Vola, you ought to have a good knowledge of the philosophical tradition that he was part of. That's just my suggestion to people. So I found that uh, a lot of people... I mean, it, there's a good thing that Evola is not part of academic philosophy in the sense that it's not as sterile, but the, but the bad thing is people will just approach him right away and not know that it, it's a process that leads to his thought. It's not just a, uh, wow, here it is, you know, let me just read this and I understand everything completely without knowing the philosophical background that brought him to this point. That's not going to work either. Space and time combine to form matter in motion. This is otherwise known as the flame of becoming. It is a raging fire that does not stop. Everything gets destroyed in this flame of time, and it was not meant to be otherwise. The problem is the way that most of us live. We exist inside this fire, or we see our existence as starting in birth and ending in death. Throughout our life, we try to gain satisfaction from this reality. We think about a future goal or object that will satisfy us, and we proceed towards trying to obtain this goal or object. The nice house, the nice car, the ideal job, this is what is desired. For those who do not achieve this, their life is misery. They cannot bear to experience a reality that does not conform to their will and wishes, to the will and wishes of their desires. For those that achieve their goals, the flame of desire grabs hold of them again, and they crave more goals and objects endlessly. Throughout their young life, they are dominated by fears and hopes, and in their old age, they are dominated by remorse and regret. This all ends in death, so your freedom to choose and try to obtain your goal amounts to nothing. This is the way of Sakama Karma, which is desiring the fruits of your actions. There is another path, and that is Nishkama Karma, and by following that path, this world of becoming this endless fire is an altar. It is an altar where we place ourselves to sacrifice to ourselves. All of our hopes and fears and our joys and sorrows are burned away in this offering to our eternal self. The world ceases to be a place of despair based upon craving things, but a magical rite where our existence is affirmed. No longer is our life based upon satisfying our desires, but is affirmed 